Once in the stillness of a late midnight hour, I could feel the presence of the Lord's saving power. I fell on my knees and I cried to him there, O oh, merciful Savior, hear this lost sinner's prayer. Now every hour and every day and every moment in every way I'm leaning on Jesus He's the rock of my soul and I'm singing His praises wherever I go Oh, I'll never forget that night on my knees The joy of that hour has never left me it's life's sweetest memory that time can erase. Now I'm saved by His mercy, and I'm redeemed by His grace. Now every hour, and every day, and every moment, in every way, I'm leaning on Jesus. He's the rock of my soul, and I'm saved singing his praises wherever I go. Amen. All right, amen. If you take your Bibles and turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4. I just want to say before I get started, I appreciate the opportunity to come up here and preach. Uh, I don't know too many people in the ministry. I count your pastor as a, a friend in the ministry. Uh, I, we don't know each other too well, but um, any, anytime you have anyone in the ministry that you can call on and know to help you, that's a friend. And I, I appreciate the times I've been uh, doing a little bit of email correspondence between each other, and I appreciate uh, the, the times he uh, responded and, and helped me. I, I consider uh, uh, your opinion um, to be uh, very important to me, and I, I'm very thankful for it. So I'm thankful for your friendship. I enjoyed being here today and the last time I was here. Um, it, I, I love your guys' church. There's a good spirit here. Uh, people are friendly. I just felt right at home here, which is a, a good thing. And so uh, I just wanted to say that before I started. Let's go to I said 2 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, before we get started, I think we will pray. If you want to, you can pray for my nerves. Uh, I've been young in the ministry. Like I said, I've been two months. Uh, and I'm used to preaching to very, very small crowds. Um, so I'm not quite used to preaching in front of as many people. I'm really going to enjoy the opportunity. But you can pray for my nerves. And I will pray for the message in the Holy Spirit as well. And we'll just go from there. We'll have ourselves a good time. All right. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to hear from you, Lord. Lord, it's not me. It's just you. It's your spirit, Lord. It's uh, you that has to do the work, Lord. Just let me be the vessel today, Lord. And I pray that you would calm down my nerves, Lord. That I would get what you would have to say, Lord. Lord, uh, I thank you for the opportunity again, Lord. Let me be uh, humble for it, Lord. And we pray that you would do these things in your holy, most precious name. And amen. amen. All right, in 2 Timothy chapter 4. We are going to start in verse 6. This is a uh, scripture that's probably familiar to most people. Uh, in chapter 6, this is Paul speaking. He says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Now I'm thankful any time I come to the scriptures and I see a promise. Here is a promise that Paul is telling us that there could await for us in glory a crown. That Paul knows he's going to get and it's there for the rest of us if we would have it, if we love his Christ appearing. Now Paul is our example of, of, uh, of how a Christian should be. It's someone that we look up to, uh, someone that would be a role model for us. And so we're going to take a little look tonight at some of the stuff that he did. Um, we'll talk a little bit about, uh, um, about love. Uh, love, is a, love is a very broad term for Americans. Uh, you can say, I love something. I can say, I love food. I really love food. Uh, I enjoy going out to eat. Uh, Brother Bailey is taking me out about three times this week. It's been a blessing. I want to come here more often. It's, just, it's, it's really good. And uh, I'm going to go out tomorrow and have some more food. I love food. But as much as I love food, love does not compare to the love that I have for my kids and for my wife. 
I, I love I love meat, but I don't love them the same amount that I love my wife and my kids. I just it's a different kind of thing there. And so when you say love, love is appearing. What are you talking about? Are you talking about that love, just a little bit of love, or is that love that you should have for Jesus Christ is that even higher than your love should be for anyone else here on this earth? It's hard to imagine that you could love someone more than your kids, more than your wife, but it is Jesus Christ who they need to go to heaven. If it was not for Jesus Christ, my, my family would have no chance of going to heaven. I would have no chance of going to heaven. I love what he has done for me, and therefore, I love him most of all. Or at least I should love him most of all. Now, I'm not the judge of anyone's hearts. I can't tell you if you love Christ appearing. Uh, I, can't, I can't tell you that. I could look at you, and you might, to me, you might seem like you love Christ, but in your heart, you don't. You might look at me and you say, that guy, that preacher's up there today, he must love Jesus Christ. He must not be able to wait until he comes. And that might not be so. It's Jesus Christ that has to know that. And he knows your heart. Uh, now, when you love someone, it should change you. When, uh, when I got married and I fell in love with my wife, uh, it changed me who I was as a man. I used to think of my own, do my own thing, and then all of a sudden uh, I started dressing a little nicer. Uh, trying to uh, be a little nicer for my, for my wife or when I was dating her at the time because I loved her. I wanted to impress her. Uh, it just, it love changes you and it should be seen on the outside if you love something. Now, I'll give you a little illustration here. Uh, this last, uh, I just graduated this last year from uh, Hope Baptist Church Institute of the Scripture, uh, my home church up in Toledo, Ohio. And for the last two years, I was working a full-time job to get through seminary. I was self-employed before that, but I took a full-time job to help me get through. And so I'd wake up every day around 8 o'clock, leave around 8.30, and around 6 o'clock I'd leave work and I'd go straight to um, class, and I'd do that Monday and Tuesday, then Wednesday I'd go to work, go straight to church, Thursday I'd wake up and go to uh, uh, work, and then go to um, institute afterwards, and then Friday work, and then finally around 8 o'clock at night on Friday, it was the first time during the week, that I'd finally get to go home and have some time with my family. Now, I'm not complaining about that. It was a really good uh, experience for me, and, and I wouldn't trade it for anything in this world. Uh, but when I would come home on Friday, it was always a special time. I'd walk up to the door, I could stand there, I could go, and I could just smell the smell coming from the house. And I know my wife was making jambalaya for me. Now, I don't know if you like jambalaya or not, but I already talked about my love for food. I'll probably mention it later, too, my love for food. But, but uh, I knew that she was making jambalaya for me. And I'd walk into that door, and my kids would run up to me, and they'd, they'd hug my leg and be, Daddy, so happy that you're home. And they'd have like a picture they drew for me that day. And then all the house would be clean, the wife's looking nice, everything is just perfect for me when I come home. And that, I just knew at that moment they loved my appearing. Because I wasn't there, I was busy working for them, and they loved the fact that I was home. Now, there were times that they could have been, there was a couple of times I'd come home, and uh, my, my wife homeschools, and she's home with the kids all day and all week without me, and so at the end of the week there were times that I'd come home, and they were done with each other. The wife was done with the kids, the kids were done with my wife, and they just did it. They were so happy when I got home, not because they were excited to see me, but they were excited that they were free from the other things that, they were, that bound them. Uh, well, Daddy's home, we can play video games. They were excited about that. Or Daddy's home, he can take care of the kids. They weren't excited about my appearing anymore. They were just excited about what my appearing brought them. And oftentimes in the Christian life, we can get confused. Uh, it's, it's manning not to be excited about Jesus Christ coming back. Uh, if nothing else, just to get rid of your, your troubles. Because uh, as soon as Jesus Christ comes back, your troubles are over. I mean, if you're a saved child of God. If you're not, they're just starting. Uh, but if you are saved, it's the best thing that could ever happen to you. But you should love him not for the fact that it's just getting you away from your troubles. But you should love Jesus Christ for what he's done for you and what he is. Amen. I think he said, Jesus Christ said that he's gone to prepare a place for us. He's on the right hand of the Father, interceding for us daily. He is working for us. Now, as much as I came home after all my work to see my family and how good it felt that they loved me, just imagine Jesus Christ coming back. And what's he going to find? Is he going to find us loving his appearing to get away from our troubles? Or do we actually love his appearing? And we get to see him. And we're thankful that it's him and we get to be with him. So just, I want you to think of this one question. Does Christ know we love his appearing? 
Now let's look at our scripture here. Uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about today is sacrifice. Paul's sacrifice is an example to us. In uh, verse 6, is For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. He is ready to be offered. He is ready to be sacrificed for Christ. This is Paul. He's in Rome. He's getting ready to be uh, executed for being a Christian. And he says, I am ready. I'm ready to be sacrificed. He's ready to give it all. I mean, his whole life you can see through the scriptures, through the book of Acts, and all the things that he's done, he has sacrificed. It is a trait of Paul. And here he is ready. Now, uh, he's ready to die. Now, there are some things that I would die for. I, I think I would die for my family. I'd like to think I would die for Jesus Christ. I would like to, I, but I'm not ready right now. I, I don't want to die today. I want to keep living. I'd rather live for Christ. I don't want to die for Christ. But he's ready to be offered. So you've got to be thankful tonight, if nothing else, that Christ is not asking anyone to die tonight. If you, if you can go home happy thinking that at least I can live for Christ and not die for Christ, that's a very exciting thing. At least to me, maybe if no one else. Uh, first thing I want to say about it is we love the things that we sacrifice for. You love what you sacrifice for. Uh, the scripture says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Uh, I used to play golf. I, I used to really like golf. I had a friend that really got me involved with golf. And I would go out uh, every time I had an opportunity to go golfing. I'd be working and then the job would blow off. Oh, it's golf time. It's time to go. And I would always have my clubs with me and I was ready to play. And so I sacrificed some money, I sacrificed some time, and I really loved golf. And then over the years, I got busy, I was going to seminary, I didn't have any time to go golfing, and then my clubs went from being where I knew where they were, to in the trunk of my car, and eventually got into my garage, and when we just moved, I found them again. And it was exciting, I found my golf clubs. But I wasn't sacrificing to it anymore, and I didn't love it anymore. If you don't sacrifice for something, you're never going to love it. If you never sacrifice for Jesus Christ, you'll never truly love Jesus Christ. It'll never happen. Uh, in the book of 1 Kings 12, 26, this is after the split of uh, Israel. This is Jeroboam, he said, uh, speaking here, he said, And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. If this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall their heart of this people turn again unto their Lord. Jeroboam knew if they went and sacrificed to God, their hearts would turn back to God. Our hearts will turn to God, to Jesus Christ, if we sacrifice to him. It'll never happen without it. Now, the second thing is, is that we know people love us because of their sacrifice. Uh, that's a pretty, pretty plain one to know. Uh, we know that God loves us because of sacrifices he's made for us. I mean, if we just uh, read in the Bible, uh, John chapter 3, 16, uh, God so loved and just stopped there, it would mean something. But it means a whole lot more that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave something. He showed his love towards us by sacrificing. I know that Jesus Christ loves me because of the sacrifice that he did for me. Uh, and so the same thing happens that Jesus Christ will know his, our love for him if we sacrifice. Now I think of, uh, back to food. I love talking about food. Uh, my, my wife making jambalaya. Now that might not sound like a big deal, but my wife hates jambalaya. She doesn't like the color of it. She doesn't like the smell of it. She doesn't like the look of it. She doesn't like anything about it. Uh, it she'd be the happiest person in the world if she never had to cook it, see it, or do anything again. I don't ask her ever to make it, but I know that she loves me because she sacrifices. Uh, she could just make something for the whole family, because no one else in the family likes it either. My kids don't like it. So no one else likes it, and yet she still does it for me because she loves me. And she's showing her love to me because of it. And that's a great thing. That's a great way that I know that she loves me. That's a great way that God, or that Jesus Christ can tell that we love him because of the sacrifices that we do. I mean, he sacrificed for us and gave us all. And if we don't give it back, I mean, how, how horrible is that? That's just the first way that we could tell. The first pattern from Paul. Second pattern from Paul is his service. Uh, so let's look here at verse 7. It says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. He's done a service for Jesus Christ. Now, once again, no one would argue that, that Paul did not serve Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus Christ told him to go somewhere, he'd go. Uh, he, he told him not to go somewhere, he wouldn't go. Uh, he wanted to please God. He wanted to please Jesus Christ in everything that he did. And uh, the first thing he did was he had the good fight. Now, a lot of people like to fight, but it's not all fight. Um... It's uh, especially where, where I live, uh, I come or where I live now, I live in Kentucky. Uh, it's pretty close, about an hour away from where the uh, Hatfield and McCoys took place. 
And, and those people there, they know how to fight, and they like to fight. It's never about anything good, but they like to fight. They're ready to fight any moment. You say something, they're ready to go. And uh, some people like that, but we've got to fight the good fight. Now, the good fight is whatever God tells you to do. Uh, it's not always to be full-time in the Christian ministry. Uh, not everyone needs to be a pastor. Not everyone needs to be a missionary. Not everyone can do that. It is vital that there are people in the church who are good Christians that come and show up every Sunday. Uh, there would be no pastors. There would be no missionaries if it wasn't for people like you being here tonight. And I, I thank you for that. Um, you're a vital component to the work of the church. Uh, but you still need to be willing to do whatever Christ would have you to do. Your fight's different than my fight. And you need to find out what that good fight is. I can't tell you for you what that fight is. Now, um, you got to be careful not to get up in the wrong fight. Uh, sometimes there's stuff that's good, but it's the wrong fight. And, uh, and take this, uh, let me say the whole thing before I get through it, uh, before you, you judge it. But uh, money, uh, retirement fund, 401k, that kind of stuff, that's not the good fight. Now, it's a good thing. If you're working and you have a job that gives you those things, take all the benefits you can get. Um, that, that's a blessing. It's a blessing from God. Take them all. Uh, most people that don't like them uh, are that way because they don't have them. Um, most of the time, I don't, I don't have them. I wish I did have benefits. I wish I did have uh, a 401k retirement plan. But that's not the good fight. The good fight is Jesus Christ. His retirement plan is way better than any retirement plan you're going to get here on earth. Uh, it's, it's, you, you just can't compare. Amen. So you got to fight the good fight. You also got to think that God is a jealous God. Uh, in Exodus 34, 14, it says, For thou shalt worship no other gods, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. He is a jealous God. Now, if uh, I have a family, and you've got to think about this in the context of a marriage. Uh, the job of the husband is to think on the things of his wife and family. And the job of the wife is to think of, his, of the husband and, and her family. Uh, sometimes there could come another individual that may need help. Uh, you may come come by someone that some some uh, just some other person. If I had another, if I saw a woman in need, and all of a sudden I stopped and I started neglecting my family and their needs, you gotta you gotta be uh, uh, you gotta know that my wife would be upset. I know people here haven't met my wife, but she's she's very southern, and I'm not this southern like Alabama kind of southern, and it's totally different. Um, I'm offending a whole bunch of people today. I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> Apologize in advance. Um, southern, she's a southern woman and she's, she's fiery. And she'd kill me. If I started spending time with another woman, it would be a good fight. She may need help. But it's not my fight. It's not my responsibility. My responsibility is to my family and to my wife. My responsibility is to my God. There might be other things out there that might look like that could be a good fight. Uh, this whole world is falling apart around us. Um, it's just, it's just crazy how all the things, and it just shows the signs of the time that Christ should be coming soon. But this world is not my fight. What God has for me is my fight. That's the good fight. Now the next thing here is he finished his course. Uh, when I think of a course, I think of a golf course. Now sometimes it's straight, sometimes it's like a dog leg to one side. Uh, there's, there's a rough, there's a greens, there's a fairway, and there's boundaries. And the closer you are into the fairways, the more, the further away you get from the boundaries, the easier the path is. And I think Paul finished his course. There was a set way and set boundaries that he was supposed to do, and he kept that. Uh, a lot of people can fight the good fight, but they don't fight the good the fight the right way. They think they can fight the fight the way they want to fight it. Uh, if uh, in um, Proverbs 11.30 says the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life and he that winneth souls is wise I don't think there's anyone here that would argue that it is wise to win souls to Christ uh, but Proverbs 18.19 says a brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city and their contentions are like the bars of a castle if you offend a brother if you offend someone they're not going to get saved uh, the, offense, the, the word of God is an offense already uh, I look at it this way. This is my rule of thumb. It is always okay for someone not to listen to me because of this. And they don't like this. It is never okay for someone not to listen to this because of me. Amen. Someday I'm going to stand in front of Jesus Christ and say, well, why didn't you listen? Why didn't you hear the words that were in my, script, in my book? Why didn't you get saved? Well, that Christian did this. They said this. It's a serious thing. People's lives, people's eternal souls hang in the balance because of the things that we do that we say and we got to remember there is a boundary there is a right way and a wrong way to do something 
Uh, Ecclesiastes 7, 8 says, Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. It is... Oh, I'm skipping some things here. Let's go to... Uh, um, I'll get to that. Uh, I have kept the faith. He's kept the faith. Um, this is the last service that he did was to keep the faith. And this can be the hardest. Uh, we always hear stories about how someone used to go to church and how someone was on fire for God and they fizzled out and they were away. Now even in this uh, chapter, we're looking here, if we go down to chapter 10 or, or verse 10 here, it says, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Here's someone that followed Paul, who was faithful to Paul, who Paul wrote about in other books, and said, Demas is that guy. Demas is the man that I need. But here at the end of Paul's life, we see Demas has forsaken him and his love the present world. He has not kept the faith. You know, all those other things, the good fight and the uh, finish my course, those things don't matter if you don't keep the faith. I think of uh, uh, in a football uh, field, if you have a kickoff and the, uh, and the returnman gets in the end zone, he runs 99 yards, he's about ready to score a touchdown, and he drops the ball on the one yard line. All that running meant nothing. It would have been better for him just to catch the ball and just stop and get his 20 yards and just keep going with life. To drop that ball and not keep the faith. I encourage you guys today, keep the faith. Amen. It could be a hard thing to do. There are many things that are going to make you want to stop following Jesus Christ. There are many things in this world that want to make you stop following Christ. But you've got to keep that faith. Um, as I read earlier, in Ecclesiastes, it said it better is the end of everything than the beginning thereof. It is better that you end well than you start well. Uh, that start, you might be good, you might come out of the, the, the gates strong, but if you don't finish strong, it's going to be bad. Uh, Christ needs to see that strong finish. If you love Christ, if you love his appearance, you need to finish strong. Um, I, I had a, 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 my job before I, I came down here. I was doing flooring, but uh, I, I happened to work in that full-time job. I was working at a rent-to-own store, uh, selling um, uh, furniture, that kind of stuff. And uh, sometimes people would just come, they'd get something, and they would try to steal it from us. And they wouldn't pay a single payment. And I'd be forced to go to the authorities and go downtown, follow a police report, and then go to court. And so one of these opportunities, I had to go to court, and I'm sitting there in court, and I'm uh, uh, just, just kind of people watching until it's my turn. Because it takes a while, even in Toledo, I could imagine a, a bigger city like Austin, how long it would take, but the process took a long time until it was my turn. So I got to people watch, which was kind of interesting. And um, I was sitting back, and, and someone would come forward, the judge would call for a certain person, that person would come up, and they'd read the counts and be like, this guy's been here about nine times, and he's coming back again for the same thing. And they got the lawyers coming up, and he's pleading the case, and they, they let him go. And then another person comes up, and, and uh, you know, they've been there seven times. And then, you know, going to the same offense, the same offense, over and over again. And you start, like, man, well, who are these people? Like, this is, this, is a, well, this is a problem. You know, and then, the, like, one person would come, and they say, well, where's this person? Oh, they're in court in this district. And they're in court somewhere else. Like, all these people are doing the same things over and over again. And I started thinking about the lawyers. I'm like, these lawyers, their job is to go every single day to go to defend these people who are guilty. How can, how can they do that? How can they feel good about themselves? And then Jesus Christ tapped me on the shoulder and said, that's what I did for you. Every day I sin. And every day he stands in heaven and says, that's me. That wasn't Steve. That was me. That was my sin. And I'll do the same thing again tomorrow and the next day. And everyone here does the same thing too. You've sinned in your life. And Jesus Christ says, that's me. That is me that did it. Now if you turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. In verse 1 it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It is reasonable to serve God. If I had to think about one of my sins, one sin would send me to hell. For the wages of sin is death. One sin would send me to an eternal lake of fire. If I could find one person here on earth, one lawyer, who would go be an advocate for me for just one of my sins and get one of my sins cleared from God, I would owe him the rest of my life. Uh, you think about people that you hear on, on, uh, um, on the news, the people that, that get in trouble. Um, O.J. Simpson is always the biggest one. I was, I was, uh, that was in 94. I was kind of too young to understand what's going on. I don't really care about the case. But he spent millions and millions of dollars to get to his, for his loyal team, our lawyer team. 
I would spend the rest of my life trying to serve a guy and trying to work my way for just one sin that could be forgiven. Now, how much for all my sins? I mean, there's not a lawyer that could even get rid of one here on earth. But I have a Savior who died for me and all my sins that I've ever done and all my sins that I will ever sin for the rest of my life. He paid for. And he took all of those. It is reasonable that I would serve Jesus Christ. It is unreasonable, therefore, for me not to serve Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is the splendor of the crown. Let's turn back to 2 Timothy. It says, Henceforth there is laid out for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto them also that love is appearing. The crown. Now, we as Americans don't appreciate crowns. Um, we had, a couple years ago, we had uh, a triple crown winner, um, but he didn't wear a crown. But we had Burger King. They have a crown. I was a kid, I remember having a crown, wearing the crown. It was always that cardboard crown. By the time you were done with the meal, the crown was destroyed. Um, but that's a crown. Uh, but as Americans, we don't understand crowns. And if we saw someone in Washington, D.C. sitting there, and they had a crown on their head, as an American, that wouldn't sit very well. Because we're just, that's just not who we are. That's not what we like. Uh, someday we will have a king with a crown, Jesus Christ. He'll be sitting on his throne for all eternity with his crown. And we will be worshiping him, so we'll get used to it eventually. But we're not used to crowns. And here, there's a crown that is being offered to us. So let's consider the crown for a little bit. Um, now when I think of a crown, you can think of a crown like a king, the king of England has a crown, the king of France had a crown, the king of Denmark had a crown, it would be the crown of England, the crown of Denmark, the crown of France. Uh, when you talked about the crown, it usually had a name for, for whoever had it, it was the crown of whatever. Uh, even Burger King, they're supposed to be the, the crown of burgers. You know, the king of burgers. I had some burgers this weekend that beat Burger King, but they're supposed to be the king of burgers. Um, and uh, um, if we use this criteria, then we got to look at this crown of righteousness. The crown of righteousness should go to the king of righteousness. Now, we are not the righteous. In Romans 3.10, it says, As is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. I'm not righteous. No one here in this building is righteous. No one on the planet has ever been born outside of Jesus Christ has ever been righteous. I don't deserve this crown. It is not my crown. This crown is Christ's crown. In 1 John 2, 1, it says, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. If there is a righteous, it is Jesus Christ. And if there is anyone worthy, the only one person to be worthy of wearing that crown would be Jesus Christ himself. But yeah, he said, if you love my appearing, this is my crown, and I'll give to you. You gave me the crown of thorns, but I can give to you the crown of righteousness. Um, we'll consider the crown some more. The best, the best example of the crown that I've been able to find is the, is the crown in England. Um, they have the crown jewels. Everyone's heard of the crown jewels. Now the crown there, uh, it has the second biggest diamond in the world. It's called the Star of Africa. The original diamond was cut in a few pieces, leaving the biggest polished portion to be just a mere 450 carats. That's a big, big, big diamond. Um, I, I, my wife would have loved that. If I would have got it, I got a little half carat, and you can see the big 450 carat diamond. Um, it's worth, it's estimated worth uh, $500 million. But really the worth of it can't be told, because it's so rare that it can't be replaced. It is, it is kept by guards, the people that, uh, um, you, can't, you can get closer, you can look at it, but it's, it's protected by uh, one of the greatest uh, security systems in the world, and people get charged 20 pounds, which I think is about $40 American equivalent, just to walk by that crown, because it's that majestic. Um, if that crown is that majestic, it is nothing compared to what the crown of righteousness will be like. Uh, Solomon's kingdom was said to have been the richest on earth. Silver was so prevalent there, they said it was like the rocks in the streets. Uh, but in heaven, the streets are made of gold. Uh, it's, it's, if you took that diamond that would be there, that would be irreplaceable here on earth, and you put it on that crown of righteousness, it would defile that crown up there that Christ has for you. That's Christ's crown. Uh, that diamond's worthless up there in heaven. Uh, if people would go from all around the world to see that crown that is in England, 
that crown that's waiting for you in heaven that could be yours. And that's something that you would never, ever would see here on earth. Uh, we just think about what it represents. Uh, during World War II, there was a time when England was afraid of a German invasion. This is the beginning of the war. And they were making contingencies for anything that could happen. And they were trying to make plans for the king and queen if something happened to get them out of the country because it was important that, that they didn't fall into enemy's hands. I believe it was King George V said he wasn't worried about himself. He was worried about the crown and the crown jewels. Because he can imagine what one picture of what it would be like with Hitler to have that crown on his head would do for the war effort. To say he was the king of England. I mean, someone else could be the king of England later, but to have that, what it represented, and it represented all of England, and all of its glorious history, of what they considered glorious history. And if he was that strong and passionate about that, what is the crown of Christ like? What is the crown of righteousness like? Uh, think about what the righteousness represents. Uh, it represents the purest, most holy man that ever lived. Uh, it represents someone who decided to leave heaven in all its glory for us. Uh, the greatest sunset that we could ever see here was nothing for him. It would be like me living in a mansion here on earth, then one day deciding to live in the deepest jungle in Africa for no reason. And that's what Christ did. Christ said, I live in the greatest thing that's ever been here in heaven. I'm going to leave here because I love you. That's righteousness. Uh, he lived for over 30 years here on earth, never sinning, always being temp tempted by the devil himself, and yet not sinning. Uh, I think about Christ on the cross. Now, there was one way that a sacrifice was not allowed to die in Scripture, and that is by strangling. And Christ was on that cross. And on a cross, when you're nailed up there, you start falling down and falling down, and you start choking and strangling. Christ was strangled on the cross. Well, that sacrifice wouldn't have been good and pure. And our sins were pushing him down, pushing him down, and he had to lift himself up to stay alive long enough so he could die at the right time and the right moment so our sins could be forgiven. That is righteousness. We are not righteous. There is going to come a time in heaven that there will be a great jubilee. And all of us are going to be there and we're going to see the crowning. That this crown is going to be given to people. And we're going to be sitting there and it's going to have all the pomp and circumstance that a, that a, a, a crowning of a king should have. And we're going to hear names go down like Paul and he's going to come down and we're going to be rejoicing in the Lord. And we're going to see him get his crown. We might hear other names come down. We might hear like John. We might hear Peter. And those names come down. We might even hear some here that come down. But will we hear our own? And then eventually, we're going to all be in the throne room of heaven. And we're going to hear, Holy, Holy, Holy. And they're going to be, the crowns are going to go up in the, in the sky. And there's going to be a great rejoicing. And we're going to be there and we're going to reach to our head. And what's going to be there? Am I going to have a crown? Is it going to be empty? Am I going to have to look at Jesus Christ and see his hands pierced? His sacrifice for me? Am I going to look around at all of glory and all of heaven and see the mansions that he's made and all the wonderful things and see his service that he's done for me and realize for all eternal eternity that I have this eternal reminder I don't have the crown of righteousness. I wasn't able to show Christ enough here on earth that I loved his appearing. Does Christ know you love his appearing? I don't need to know. It's Jesus Christ who matters. He's the righteous judge. Does Christ know you love his appearing? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Pastor, if you want to come forward and pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your message that you've given us, Lord. We want to have that crown, Lord. I don't want to end this life and leave this life without it. Uh, I want... I want to love you, Lord. I want you to know that I love you. Uh, nothing else uh, would matter when I get to heaven but knowing that that, that was there, Lord. Uh, Lord, I pray that there is some here that, uh, that aren't serving you, Lord, that aren't sacrificing you, Lord, that you would just uh, have them do that. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would do all these things in your holy most precious name. And amen. Pastor. Let us stand, please, number 160 in the book. If you'd like to sing along on the invitation number, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, number 160. As Brother Brantley leads us in this number, I hope you'll consider carefully the love of the appearing of Jesus Christ our Lord. And, of course, the Bible, I believe, teaches us that our service for the Lord is proportionate to the amount of love that we have for the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And uh, I don't know about you, but I think to myself a lot of times, I love the Lord, but I don't love Him like I should. And I pray that the Lord might help me to love Him more. 
you might want to come to the altar and pray that very thing uh, tonight. Think about that crown of righteousness and the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. Uh, I couldn't help but have go through my mind as our brother was talking about the crown of righteousness. Uh, the Lord crowns us with His righteousness. He is the righteous one. Boy, he, he deserves our thanks. He deserves our loyalty. He deserves our service. He deserves our sacrifice. And if you're here tonight and you're not saved, or you don't know whether you're saved or not, but you don't want to gamble with your soul, I invite you to come meet me down here at the front. God bless you to know and do His will as our brother leads us in this song. If God's speaking to your heart, come right away. Oh soul, are you